Welcome to Real Physics. Why I am doing science on YouTube. People sometimes ask me and they say if you have something serious to say why do you choose such a platform and where are your peer-reviewed publications? Now I will try to answer these questions in the video but I think already the question contains some misconception about what constitutes science. Now, I love science, but I would honestly invite you to reflect upon the current state. Let's see the historian of science, Derek de Solia Price. I like very much his book, Little Science, Big Science. And he mentions that he read the Philosophic Transactions of the Royal Society of London line by line from 1662 to 1930 and it contained all the knowledge of the time of course fundamental physics but not only physics so you had a kind of overview of the entire science and compare that to today's science you have this explosion of knowledge zillions of publications you note the logarithmic scale and it's literally impossible to oversee all this knowledge. I give you a concrete example. Look at Physical Review D and Physical Review D exclusively deals with the very fundamentals of particle physics and cosmology but it's of course just one of dozens of renowned physical journals and it now uh, it's issued every two weeks in a volume that contains more than 1000 pages. Go figure it. I mean you can read Physical Review D 24 7 and still you get less than 20 minutes for one page with 10 formulas you need to think about and your own thinking is not included yet what i want to say is it's literally impossible to digest all this knowledge to oversee that and um, sometimes sometimes people are claiming oh we need a, we need a new einstein in physics who magically comes up with a new idea that revolutionizes everything. No, it's impossible. It's not that we are stupid, we have 8 billion people on the planet, but I think physics has transformed into something which cannot be overseen as a matter of principle. It's, it has become a mess, it has become boring and bureaucratic, and in the words of Nassim Taleb, it's clearly part of mediocristan as opposed to extremistern where the interesting things happen. And these are two graphs are not precisely analogous, but today's institutional science is a business. It's, I mean, everybody is collecting in the in his scientific career publications and so on and so forth. And it's a boring enterprise. And YouTube or the internet in general, I think is a way to bring back science to extremistern where it belongs to. So many people have noted, like Alvin Weinberg in his Reflections on Big Science, that science has turned from a purpose of life into a means of subsistence. And this is of course also a characteristic of normal science as described by Thomas Kuhn in his famous work The Structure of Scientific Revolutions. He talks about paradigm shifts that occur very rarely and you have these long phases of normal science in which there's not much fundamental progress or no breakthroughs but just an accumulation of the existing knowledge and a refining and fine-tuning. And of course this normal science is part of mediocristan and peer review is part of mediocristan and I mean, it's, it's strange that people consider peer review as a necessity of something essential to true science. I mean, when did true science start? It started in 1600, okay, or even before. And peer review you have after World War II, basically around the 1940s or 1930s. And think about, I mean, Einstein was very annoyed by the peer review process his most famous paper in 1905 was published by Max Planck. Max Planck who described his editorial philosophy as to shun more the reproach of having suppressed strange opinions than that of having been too gentle in evaluating them. 
So peer review is part of the modern scientific culture, but if you want to understand science, you need to look at the entire history, and that's what I did in my book. I say that physics has transformed from a natural philosophy-oriented science to something that does not address anymore the fundamental questions. And that's why we do not have real progress since around 1930, I guess. These are the people who really found out something but it's an entirely new kind of science that developed after World War II. And by the way, I also believe that there is a whole lot of crap out there, just if you read the titles. But I mean, you don't need to agree with me. I am a critic of these modern string Susi stuff and all these theoretical physics. But one thing is sure, physics does not have an overarching idea what they want to achieve. They don't have an idea what is, what are the fundamental questions, what would be a real breakthrough, what would be a theory of everything. I like very much the quote by David Lindley. He said, there is no way in advance what this theory of everything would look like, but most physicists like to think when they see they will recognize it. This is something I addressed in this video. Not that I claim that I have a theory of everything or something remotely close to it, but we need to talk about what do we want, what do we want to achieve, what our goals are, what are the fundamental questions that is missing in today's discussion about fundamental physics. And one thing is that modern physics is often detached from reality. The other thing is that also the discussion about what science, about what is important physics, is detached from reality. I think this is a very interesting quote by Erwin Schrödinger. A theoretical science in which its members continue to jargonize will inevitably be cut off from the rest of the cultural community. In the long run, it will ossify however lively the chatter may continue within its isolated circles and experts. Thus, I believe the internet or YouTube is also a means by which you can bring back that contact to reality into society because isolated circles of experts easily lose contact to reality and sometimes walk off to absurdity. So um, that's also in line, I think, with Karl Popper, who said that intellectuals make ideologies out, out of their theories. Unfortunately, also in physics, many ideologies exist. Who does not follow the fashion easily drops out of the community members, which are taken seriously. And it's precisely in these communities where this boring peer-reviewed process of normal science takes place and for disruptive science I think you need really to think about other means of communication. You need to get the message out as Paul Feyerabend claimed in his book Against Method. And yeah, I'm trying to bring physics into contact with reality regarding content but also regarding the scientific debate. And I think genuine scientific debate is also essential for science and that's also what you can bring back via internet, via YouTube, into science. And I think it tells you something that this discussion about the need of a new collider has got about 1000 views and my comments on this discussion has got more than 100 times views. I'm not boasting here, I'm just asking the questions how much contact to the kind of science do you have people really need. So YouTube videos or even interviews I think are a good tool for scientific exchange. People are not afraid of talking to me, sometimes they may regret it. Well, I think a conversation sometimes gives you also valuable nonverbal information and Another thing I want to stress is that I myself came to discover very interesting physics because I watched YouTube and the example is Pierre-Marie Robitaille. I knew his papers and I had even cited them, but I really appreciated this, his research when I first saw his YouTube lecture in 2014. And you know, in today's scientific environment, you are overwhelmed with information. There are so many papers, much more that you can read. And you need to do a choice. You need to find out to which paper I dedicate my time. 
what do I read, what do I listen, and I think it gives you very valuable extra information if you see that a person is trustworthy to begin with. And sometimes, yeah, for me, it's, it's more important how people do science than the actual content, because the actual content is it's just too much out there. Well, what I try to offer also here is, uh, whether you like it or not, is my perspective. I'm working as a teacher, and I think it's nothing wrong with it. And in my spare time, I try to do fundamental physics. I like to go hiking in the mountains and thinking and writing down stuff occasionally in my notebooks, but that's the way I have chosen to do science. And of course, there's another alternative channel with which I try to do fundamental physics. I think a book is a much better means to expose an important idea in all detail than just one article. Yes, and I also, I don't like to discuss and, and debate with reviewers. For me, that is a much more direct approach to address fundamental questions. If you want to see my papers, you can go to ResearchGates and, or go to my homepage and look for research. I do not have many peer-reviewed papers, but I think some decent ones. And yes, uh, I think YouTube is at least an important complementary tool and of course it has also its disadvantages. It really sucks when you have to go through this list of is there violence or shocking content or controversial issues, but <laughs> as long as in science we don't have censorship and people do not consider controversial if I propose an alternative theory for cosmology, I think it's fine. If you enjoyed the video, don't forget to like it. And if you're interested in fundamental physics, subscribe to this channel.